Fall 2021 has descended upon the anime community like a grand piano upon a Looney Tune. So busy were we wiping our collective brow and dramatically catching our collective breath after narrowly escaping the dimly lit dynamite factory of spring that by the time we noticed its ballooning shadows swallowing us whole, we barely had time to look up, look down, look up again, hold up a little sign that said mother, and break into a Sonic the Hedgehog wheel run, causing the pavement beneath us to spool up like rumpled carpet behind us instead of propelling us forward before it crushed us all. Luckily, you've got me to guide you out from under this massive pile of hyped-up adaptations, hotly anticipated sequels, and exciting original experiments. That's right, I watched all of the more than 30 new full-length anime that are out this fall, and now I'm ready to tell you the 10 that are most worth your time. These are the ones to watch for Fall 2021, sponsored by ExpressVPN. A common complaint I hear from non-North American viewers under these videos is that many of the titles I mention aren't available on the streaming sites I highlight in your respective regions. By rerouting your Crunchyroll or Funimation connection through one of their high-speed servers in 94 different countries, though, ExpressVPN makes that problem a thing of the past. And not just for anime. With the click of one button on their easy-to-use apps and browser extensions, US users can enjoy Blackadder and Rick and Morty on UK Netflix and turn about being fair play, UK users can pull a vice versa to watch Hunter Hunter on Netflix US. I, as a humble Canadian, use it all the time to get the best of all three worlds. And that's still just the tip of the iceberg. With ExpressVPN, you can save money with regionally discounted subscriptions on everything from Netflix to Spotify to NBA League passes. ExpressVPN's high-grade encryption also protects the data on your mobile device of choice from public Wi-Fi snoops and other potential ne'er-do-wells. To try it for yourself and learn how you can get three months of service absolutely free, click the link in the doobly-doo or head to expressvpn.com slash basement today. Tunneling web traffic through a server in another country is one thing. Actually visiting and experiencing the culture and history firsthand is another entirely. And the chance to learn such things is just one reason of many that I adore anime like today's first recommendation, Heike Monogatari. The epic account of the Heike or Taira clan's fall in the 1100s is one of the foundational works of Japanese literature, a story literally every schoolchild has heard told many times. But rarely has it ever been told as masterfully as it is here, under the direction of the legendary genius animation savant Naoko Yamada, working not with her usual crew at Kyoto Animation, but rather with Masaki Yuasa's boundary-pushing digital animation house Science Saru, whose tech and artistic technique have allowed them to create a show that looks exactly like a traditional Japanese watercolor painting come alive. And how lively it is with that traditionally elegant brushwork and carefully applied motion smearing, allowing for a remarkable degree of smooth, dynamic motion. This is one of the most beautiful anime you will ever see. Or hear, for that matter, thanks to its moving, traditional musical score from future Chainsaw Man composer Kensuke Ushio, and well-considered sound direction from Gundam legend Eriko Kimura. And, of course, this is Naoko Yamada we're talking about, so it goes without saying that all the music and motion unite in perfect harmony to form a seamless, captivating whole. And the story, which presupposes the audience's pre-existing knowledge of its events by framing itself around the doomsaying visions of a psychic orphan, is equally brilliant in its own non-traditional way. Kaon and Romeo x Juliet's Reiko Yoshida pen the script after all, and few can match her delicate mastery of character and pacing. Like Odd Taxi back in spring, I have a bad feeling that most conventional anime fans will pass this one by without much thought, but if you appreciate the finer points of cinema, anime, or Japanese history, you will not want to miss it. 
Those with a keen eye for high art, and anyone who enjoys high school melodrama for that matter, are likewise likely to like Maji director Koji Masunari's adaptation of Blue Period, which is, among many other reasons to get hyped for it, the first Netflix anime since Violet Evergarden to get the simulcast treatment. And it's not the only one this season, but we'll get to that, and all those other reasons. I just wanted to celebrate for a brief second the fact that they managed to close Netflix jail before Guantanamo. Anyway, Blue Period is a much-hyped seinen manga about a stylish high school second year named Yatora Yaguchi, who, after a life spent pursuing popularity in a vain attempt to be happy, finally finds a path to true satisfaction and self-expression through his school's art club. And the anime based on that manga makes me want to paint and do other artsy stuff like write this very script in exactly the same way that Haikyuu and Baby Steps compel me to run around and yell and stuff. It is a crystallization of adolescent passion and angst, a triumphant tribute to artistic expression as a concept. Also, it's pretty funny, I really like the characters, and the dialogue is packed with subtext, unsurprisingly since this is another Reiko Yoshida script. It's just a rock-solid anime drama. The animation does vary a bit in its dynamism and quality, but the background art is more than good enough to make up the difference. The paintings at the core of the story in particular are rendered with remarkable realism and clear appreciation for the unique quirks of each different medium, from oil on canvas to watercolor. Just as the top sports manga exhaustively research the technical intricacies of their respective physical activities, Blue Period faithfully captures the real technique and skill it takes to really make great art. And in doing so, it makes fine art feel accessible and fun. Speaking of great art, let me tell you about Sakugan. Its title may not actually have anything to do with Sakuga. See the video in the top right corner if you don't know what that word means. It's actually a portmanteau of sacks and guns based on a contest-winning sci-fi novel that... Why am I going on about this? The only point I'm trying to make is that there is a more than linguistically appropriate quantity of Sakuga in Sakugan. There's also a rather stirring story in there, to complement the nice animation, about a man, Gagumber, and his daughter, Mamempu, who live in an underground colony connected to a massive tunnel labyrinth complex that's all the world mankind has ever known. The father-daughter duo work as miners, using a special, customized mining mech tricked out by Mamempu, who, despite being a miner, the other kind of miner, already has a college degree, and she's got big dreams to go with it, of leaving the digger life and becoming a marker, one of the mech-suited professional adventurers who make a living probing the secrets of the Great Labyrinth. But that labyrinth is full of kaiju, and perhaps even worse dangers deeper in, so Gagumber is understandably none too happy about the prospect of his nine-year-old daughter taking on such a dangerous vocation. Therein lies the show's central character conflict, a classic dynamic between an overprotective dad and an overachieving child, while its central action conflict will, of course, be about getting a giant robot past an entire world full of kaiju to that labyrinth's exit. Sakugan is basically Made in Abyss meets a Goofy movie by way of Gurren Lagann, and I feel like that's all I should need to say about it. Speaking of precious daughters you'll want to protect even if they don't need it, Irina, vampire cosmonaut, also has the potential to induce such feelings, up until they put a dog collar on her, at which point you're gonna start feeling a different kind of thing that mutually excludes the other one. Yes, perhaps in honor of the bloody cravings the titular creatures are known for, this show is thirsty as all get out. For soda water but also for euphemisms, and especially for mouths. These animators like lips and teeth about as much as Nagatoro's liked hands, which is a lot if you're not the kind of media-poisoned weirdo who notices these things. Anyway, Irina would be quick to tell you that the whole bloodthirst thing is actually a gross and unfair stereotype pushed on vampires by humans who they don't eat 
anymore. In truth, vampires are a mostly normal group of mountain-faring people who just happen to have no sense of taste, severe heat sensitivity, fangs, and near superhuman athletic ability, and are discriminated against by the people of the UZSR just for being different. Which, for the Republic's regime, makes them an ideally expendable stepping stone between dog murder and boots on the moon in their space race against the UKA, who, for their part, still almost certainly built their rockets with the help of not oh, scientists in this timeline, so no one's hands are really clean here. And that's exactly what I like so much about this show. Through a lightly distorted lens of historical fantasy, it examines the dark and messy side of the space race, the political power games and shady cover-ups behind the scenes. But at the same time, it never loses sight, through the eyes of Irina and her human handler Lev, of the simple, universally idealistic dream of touching the stars that drove us up there to begin with. If you're a space travel, history, or sci-fi enthusiast, you will not want to miss this anime. Uh, that said, vampire enthusiasts are famously hesitant to embrace any fiction that strays too far from the essential rules that have governed the creature ever since we made it up, especially if it involves sparkling, so they may not be as enthused about Irina. But worry not! If you're the sort of connoisseur who insists their bloodsuckers come with pale skin, pointy fangs and pointier hair and crumble to dust when the sun so much as looks at them, the vampire dies in no time has you covered, especially on that last point. Draluk is an ancient, immortal, and invincible progenitor vampire who has been terrorizing his town for years. Or at least that's what the local tour bus company prints on their brochures, which is what leads world-renowned, social media-conscious freelance vampire hunter Ronald to come knocking on his door. That, and reports that the Count has kidnapped a child, which turn out to be as grossly exaggerated as the reports of his power. In reality, the kid was just breaking into Drolik's house during the day when he's asleep to play his video games, which the vampire has a lot of because he's actually a hikikomori dweeb who turns to dust when anything so much as looks at him. Smells garlic? Dust. Sees a cross? Dust. Light pad on the back? You best believe that's a dustin. He does reconstitute about as quickly as he disintegrates, so it's not that much of an inconvenience to him, but he is an inconvenience to pretty much everyone else, especially Ronald after he burns the Count's manor down and has to put him up in his office. Though if I were him, I don't think I'd look that gift PlayStation and adorable armadillo mascot in the mouth quite so quickly. I'm rambling, though. As a high-concept sitcom, my recommendation of The Vampire Dies in No Time ultimately boils down to a single sentence. I laughed at this. A lot. And if anything I just said sounds funny to you, you probably will too. Now, if human-undead relations are a topic of interest to you, you might also want to check out The Faraway Paladin. Also, if you like isekai power fantasies, because it's definitely one of those, and a pretty good one of those. Specifically, it's an isekai in the vein of Mushoku Tensei. Not in the weird, horny kid sense, this reincarnated nerd is more precocious and curious than anything, but rather in the rich, textured, world-building sense, featuring a classically inspired word-based magic system reminiscent of Earthsea, which an extended period of the story spends fleshing out along with the protagonist childhood. And what makes that childhood so interesting, in contrast to Rudius's self-directed growth, is who's doing the child rearing. A trio of former, or should I say late, heroes. Will has a ghost wizard for a grandpa, a mummy for a mommy, specifically a mummy priestess, and a skeleton warrior for a dad, who do their best to teach him their skills and values and take care of him in the basement of a long-abandoned church, which is in turn surrounded by desolate wilderness and the decaying husk of an equally abandoned city. But what happened to all the people there? Where did they all go, and why is Will still here? What caused these clearly noble souls to linger so long on Earth in unholy undeath? And what must the gods of this world be like to leave this place and these people in such a sorry state? 
These questions hang heavy above the early steps of our hero's journey, and in grand fantasy role-playing tradition, they promise to give way to yet greater mysteries as he travels into the greater world and starts down the path to become a paladin. If you're a fan of heady, rich fantasy, I mean, you do already have season two of Mushoku Tensei to enjoy this season, but The Faraway Paladin has shown nearly as much promise in its early episodes and is definitely worth keeping an eye on. Speaking of promise, Boji, the protagonist of Ranking of Kings, seems to show absolutely none, which is a bit of a problem for him and his country because the deaf, mute, physically weak young prince is next in line to be its king, and kings in this world have to fight orcs and monsters and stuff like that. From peasants to soldiers to his own queen's stepmother, the land is full of folks who look down on Boji as a simpleton and lament that the throne will be his by birth one day instead of going to his taller, mightier half-brother. But not all strength is physical, and this little prince isn't nearly as feeble or simple as all the folk who can't see past his disability so blindly assume. Undaunted by the naysayers, his goal is to be a great king one day, and despite all the doubt, he may even become the greatest ever. That's a long way off, though. For now, this anime simply follows him as he makes new friends and comes of age against a backdrop that's painted beautifully and set behind characters animated with elastic fluidity by Wit Studio under the debut direction of Yosuke Hata, a former storyboarder and episode director on Death Parade, One Punch Man, and Akka 13. Don't be like those town folk and let its cute, simple looks fool you. Ranking of Kings is a thoughtful, meaty, emotionally potent little anime that fantasy fanatics and animation lovers alike are sure to adore. Not that anime needs an out there high concept to be fun. In the right hands, a great anime can be spun from an idea as simple as a short-tempered short lady has to work with a tall guy who's loud and annoying, but also adorable in a dick gumshoe kind of way. That's just about the whole plot of My Senpai is Annoying. Well, that and whatever's going on between Futaba and Harumi's co-workers, Sota and Toko, the antics of the various supporting characters in and around the office, the general low-stakes drama and tedious repetitive work that naturally comes with a salary man gig, it's an office comedy. You know how those work. It's a really good office comedy, though. I honestly don't know how much more there is to say about it. It's got really cute character chemistry and nearly as cute character designs, the animation has a lot of fun, characterful flourishes, and the storyboarding exudes a keen eye for composition and a sharp sense of comic timing. If you watched Otakoi, I don't even have to finish this sentence because you started adding this to your Funimation queue as soon as you realized I was making that comparison. If you haven't seen Otakoi, does a heartwarming, realistic romance between likable adults sound like fun to you? Then watch My Senpai is Annoying. Also Otakoi. And a Gretzko. There's a lot of good shows like this. Annoying Senpai ain't the only great com with a gentle touch of ROM in it this season, though. I promised at the top of this video that we'd get to Fall's other, bigger Netflix jailbreaker, and here, in the penultimate slot, we are. Komi-san Can't Communicate is one of the most anticipated anime adaptations, not just of this season, but the entire year. The original manga, about an impossibly pretty, statuesque high school girl named Komi who, despite being the automatic idol of her entire class, instantly beloved by all, is utterly incapable of uttering a single word to another person. While everyone else assumes she's standoffish and arrogant because of this, after they get over hooting and hollering over her cool beauty demeanor, her desk neighbor, Tadano Hitohito, who specializes in reading rooms, accurately assesses what really ails our heroine and vows via chalkboard chat room to help her. Thus begins a touching, hilarious, surprisingly deep story about growing up and opening up, which has been propping up the venerable Shonen Sunday magazine for the last five years. This anime is a big deal, in other words. And thus, while I can't see for myself how good the anime itself is until Netflix drops episode one on the 21st, they're almost simulcasting, there's a slight delay. I am going to make the educated prediction that it will be one of the season's best shows and a possible anime of the year contender. Not just because the manga itself is good, of course, but because the folks animating it are badasses. 
OLM, short for Oriental Light and Magic, has been around since you could name a company that, and is low-key one of the most powerful anime studios in existence. Most anime fans hear the name, and if they think at all, they think, oh yeah, the Pokemon guys, but have you seen the Pokemon anime lately? Because while I can't show it for copyright reasons, that shit slaps, and they make it every week. Give OLM time to make a single season show, and they reinvent art with Odd Taxi. Give them OVA resources, and you get the original Berserk. If they take a show seriously, and Comey's trailer screams that they're taking it as seriously as they possibly can, it's gonna be seriously good. The director, Ayumu Watanabe, is likewise the type who thrives under the pressure of a weekly production schedule, just look at Space Brothers, but much like OLM, when given the time and resources to make something beautiful, he does. Just look at After the Rain, and do not ask what it's about. And as all of his work, even the Ace Attorney anime demonstrates, he's especially adept at balancing awkwardly big, quirky casts of characters, which is kind of what Komi's all about. In other words, the manga's in as safe hands as it possibly could be, and knowing that, I can confidently say, based on trailers and the quality of the manga alone, that Komi-san Can't Communicate will live up to the hype as an anime, and is a one to watch this fall. It is not, however, the fall anime I'm most hyped for. As promised, I saved that one for the end, and as is ordained by the Dark Lord of Listicles, before I say it, I am compelled to mention, honorably, some of the good anime that didn't quite make the cut today. Also Platinum End and Tesla Note, which are both very not good in the best possible way. If the phrases biggest, dumbest battle royale and bizarro world X-arm perk your ears up, definitely give those a look. As far as actually good anime goes, there's Selection Project, an American Idol-style, competition-driven idol show with some really sharp cinematic sensibilities, Digimon Ghost Game, the latest iteration of the sophisticated eight-year-old's monster-battling franchise of choice, which reimagines Digimon as fodder for creepy modern urban legends. It's fun stuff, good Halloween viewing if you got kids. Kids and nostalgic Gen Xers might also appreciate the colorful fun of Mutakin the Dancing Hero, a remake of an extremely retro anime about a musical rollerblading superhero fighting aliens that feels aesthetically like Vaporwave on Adderall. And for the kids who think they're too cool for all that baby stuff, Build Divide Code Black is a gritty, dark, cyberpunk children's card game commercial with some pretty decent action in it. Old, tired adults, on the other hand, will probably appreciate Banished from the Hero's Party, I Decided to Live a Quiet Life in the Countryside, a pastoral fantasy light novel adaptation about a former adventurer working as a small-town apothecary that's got some really good character writing in it. And slightly younger, more vigorous adults will likely get a kick out of The World's Greatest Assassin Gets Reincarnated in Another World as an Aristocrat, which solves Isekai's boring protagonist problem by replacing Kirito Clone 42069 with Agent 47. There's also Rumble Garandal, a fun, passionate mecha action deal about an army of Akiba otaku staging a revolt against a militaristic, ultra-nationalistic, possibly alien-backed Japanese government that has banned anime, video games, and porn. Lucky for us, we get to live in a differently dystopian timeline where at least we can watch Mieruko-chan, an adaptation of an exceptional horror comedy manga that doesn't quite successfully translate the horror half of that equation to the screen, but does at least try to make up for it by being 69 out of 10 stupid, I mean stupid horny. But before you check out any of those, you need to see Tacked Up Destiny, a semi-original anime produced by Bandai Namco Arts and DNA to promote their upcoming mobile game of a similar name and animated in a joint effort by MAPPA and Madhouse under the direction of Grand Blue Fantasy's Yuki Ito. Sounds like a setup for a mediocre cash grab, right? And yet, Tacked Up Destiny sings off the screen with scene after scene of sumptuous Sakuga 
fuga timed perfectly and classily to classical piano music. In a similar setup to last year's listeners, the show is set in an Americana world besieged by music-hating aliens who can only be stopped by musically powered, hot person-shaped personal anime weapon platforms. Unlike listeners, however, this show is actually good. Instead of stringing together a series of popular music references and trying to call that a plot, Tactop immediately begins weaving different styles of music, from ragtime to Beethoven, into the fabric of its action and the emotional core of its story. Stellar ambient sound design really sells the dystopian feeling of a world without music to us, and because of the vast and contrasting negative audio space that creates, each and every scene with music, which are almost always fights, instantly pops like Squid Game Pink on Green. And all the while, the equally excellent animation is taking full advantage of that whole sound situation to send you into Sakuga Sensory Overload. It is just an incredibly fun anime, and that extends from the action to the core cast. Our hero, Tact the Conductor, is an aloof genius pianist who thinks only about playing music. Meanwhile, his monster fighting music art partner Destiny is a cold, single-minded killing machine obsessed with destroying the alien D2s. And stuck in a tiny car between the two of them, like the manager of a particularly rowdy rock band, is Anna Schneider, the all-too-quiet voice of reason who must do her best to get the two of them to New York in one piece, despite their best efforts. Tactop has positively delightful character chemistry, tied up in an intoxicating road trip vibe that feels vaguely reminiscent of Cowboy Bebop, which is about as high a compliment as I can pay an anime ensemble. This is one of those anime that reminds me why I love anime, and while Heike Monogatari may be more technically proficient and better overall, that alone is enough to make Tactop Destiny my favorite of the fall. And with that, you got the whole list. I'll leave it on screen until the end card so you can write things down, because you guys are always asking for that, and yeah, what the heck, let's cram those honorable mentions into the bottom corner, too. Tell me which one of these animes your favorite in the comments down below, and if I helped you find a new fave, consider returning that favor in the traditional form of a like and subscribe. Also, if you haven't already, make sure you catch up on my ongoing roast of the anime scripture of an actual literal cult, since episode two of that is due out this month. I'm Jeff Thu, professional too much anime watcher, signing out from finally sleep. <laughs>